Hello everyone and welcome to Journal for Jills. My name is Lewis and in today's episode of JFG Meets we have former Gillingham forward Cody McDonald on the show. Obviously, unfortunately, due to the current coronavirus pandemic we were apart when having the chat so it did have to be a phone interview but do stay tuned for inside stories on jumping from non-league to the championship, his loan spell at Gillingham, his partnership with Akin Fenwa, the move to Coventry, joining the Jills on loan during the title winning season, joining permanently, the positives and negatives of his stay, facing his old club whilst at Wimbledon, his time at Ebbsfleet, his injury rehab, the future and more. Enjoy. So we're now joined by a former Gillingham forward, Cody McDonald. Cody, thank you for coming on, mate. How are you keeping at the minute? Yeah, really good. Cheers, mate. Yeah, all good. Obviously, difficult times and with everything that's going on in the world, but um, yeah, not too bad. Yeah, nice one, nice one. Hopefully we can give people their football fix for for an hour or so and... Um, Delve, in, delve into your career because I'm sure you're a well as you know you're a pretty popular person around the Gillingham part so um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully people enjoy it we'll start at the beginning um, before we get to Gillingham what got you into football originally why football I don't know I think obviously when you're a young kid I think every little boy's dream and girl's dream is obviously um, to be a footballer I think and it's just the most popular sport about and yeah I suppose I obviously got sucked in a little bit um when I was young, I think I was about eight or nine when I first joined, like my first team. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, just kicked on from there really. So mm-hmm. yeah, just you sort of get the buzz straight away, then you're just kicking the ball in the back garden, and it just sort of progresses from there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's quite easy to get into football as well, isn't it? So I think even if you fall into it and you've got a bit of talent, then you sort of end up going down that road. Um, yeah, I mean, just with, even when you're with your friends, and that's just an easy conversation isn't it, to talk about football. There's so much going on. Yeah. on and off the pitch with things and there's good banter to be had. Can you just talk a little bit about um, your progress your progress through academies because you didn't come through an elite academy, did you? No, I didn't. I was um, I was about 11 when I signed for uh, we, me and one of my good pals, um, local, playing for a local team, got signed for Ipswich and we was there for about three years, I think, uh, till I was about 14. Then I went to QPR for a season um, and then, yeah, from the age of 15, I just sort of didn't just just carried on playing Sunday league football with my mates. Um, yeah, up until I was 22, really, just Sunday league and playing Saturday football with pals and local, really, until, until I was lucky enough to get spotted for Norwich. Yeah, and I know one of the teams you had quite a quite a while at was was Witham, Witham Town. Um, yeah. What was it like having a few years there? Because you had a pretty decent record and a fair chunk of time there as well. Yeah, I mean, that that was really where I learned my, my trade, as they say. Um, you know, coming into men's football was the first first thing I had at men's football. So um, I sort of I learned the tough side of it, you know, getting kicked about and yeah, yeah. taking the rough with the smooth, I suppose, as they say. And, and it's my hometown as well, so it was nice because there was people there that I knew. I still live there now. Um, so, yeah, it's, there's, there's people about that I knew and my family could come and watch easy enough, so it was an enjoyable time. It was a good time. Yeah. Before you joined Norwich, you darted around a little bit, the likes of Malden, Dartford as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wh- why was it so many teams in a short time period? To be honest, I um, I, I left Whitton and up because the manager that was at Whitton the whole time I was there left and went to Malden, which is just on the outskirts of Whitton, and he, he wanted to take me over there. So I went over, and I think I only played two or three games for him, yeah. and something happened at the club. So um, everyone left, and then I didn't play for about two months, and then it was... Um, I found out that my wife now was pregnant with twins. Yeah. So um, I thought the few extra pounds that you can earn from part-time football would have come in handy. So I sort of put my name around a little bit and then Dartford got back to me and said, yeah, we'd love you to come over and just train because you haven't played for a little while. It'd be nice to sort of come over, see, see what you've been up to and see if you're still fit and in shape and sort of thing. Yeah. And then I went. I remember I went on the Thursday training, and they literally signed me straight after the first training session. So, um, and then yeah, I had a, I had quite a prolific spell there where everything I touched sort of went to gold, and then it sort of progressed from there, really. Yeah, and the move to Norwich, like you say, you're lucky enough to get scouted. How did that whole move happen, and when were you aware of their interest, sort of thing? Um, well, I had a call from an agent. Um, obviously, I didn't know that side of the game. I obviously knew there was football agents and that, but yeah. I'd never been in contact with one. And a fellow called Dan Fletcher got in contact with me and said, oh, I've, I've got a few football league teams that are looking at you. Will you come and sign for my agency? And I was like, look, so I don't really know the ins and outs of all of that. I said, but if you get me a, a move to a professional team, full-time football, then yeah, of course I'll sign with you. And then 
within uh, two weeks, I think it was, Brian Gunn was coming and watching me. He was the head scout at Norwich at the time. And then Glenn Roder got sacked a few days before it was It was sort of all set up for me to go and have a trial with him. And I, obviously you're thinking the worst. It's all going to go wrong now. You're not going to get your chance. But yeah. uh, luckily for me, Brian... Brian Gunn got the job, so um, I didn't. I went and had a trial, and then it was the following weekend. Um, he came to watch me for Dartford. I actually got injured in the game. I had to come off after about twenty minutes. I got a, a mental. It was only a dead leg, but I just literally couldn't shake it off. It was just one of them, and I was literally couldn't walk for about two weeks after. And I was thinking, ah, oh, the chance is gone. But yeah. I went and had my medical the following morning, um, and it was all fine, really. So. Nice one, and that, they were in the championship, weren't they? So that's quite a big, quite a big deal. Yeah, they were in the championship. Yeah, at the time, so it's, it was obviously a massive jump. I've gone from Ryman Division One North straight into the championship within within two weeks. I was playing in front of like twenty seven thousand people, and just yeah, it was just crazy, really. Yeah, I, the agent done his job then. <laughs> yeah, he done he done a, he done a good job. To be yeah, fair, so yeah. that's what they're for. Yeah, <laughs> decent, decent. And at Norwich, do you remember your, your pro debut? I do, yeah. I mean, it was it was due to come about quite. It, it sort of took a while. I was injured for a couple of weeks. Obviously, what we just said about the the injury at Dartford, and it took a couple of weeks to me to get back to training. And we'd already had a few conversations about sort of easing me in a little bit because obviously it's a massive transition from scaffolding and playing part time football and yeah. going into full time football. It's a, a lot more workload on your body. Uh, getting used to it and getting up to fitness standards and that. By the time I was actually back training after the injury, it was it was a good number, couple of weeks after that before I was I was actually playing. So uh, I think I was on the bench for a few games, not, not coming on, and then yeah, it was at home against Cardiff, one nil up, and I come on with about fifteen minutes to go. I think it was just a surreal feeling, really. Yeah, yeah, and I think I'm right in saying Norwich actually got relegated that year. Yeah, we got relegated. I think it was. Maybe not the last day of the season, but maybe the one just before that last, yeah, last one or two games before the end, we lost away at Charlton. I think it was four two, maybe. Um, yeah, got relegated unfortunately. But like I say, I'm I'm quite one of them people that everything happens for a reason. And I mean, Norwich took the step back to get the step that they needed to uh, financially get themselves stable again, and then they just massively kicked on from there. Within two seasons, they were back in the Premier League. So, yeah. uh, although it wasn't a great feeling at the time, within eighteen months, it was a good feeling. So it was it was unbelievable, really. Yeah, I'm gonna, I was going to say you join you join in like February time, and you're sort of like you're not really part of the whole season sort of thing, and you've not been there the whole time. So if they go down, and then you're like, right, we've got a chance in League One. I'm going to rebuild that sort of thing. So I suppose. I know it's terrible to go down, but it's your chance to go again sort of thing, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, from my point of view, I was thinking that I'm going to get a good chance to play every week in League One. Um, obviously, Championship was a massive, massive jump up, and I think I've done OK. So, um, I was still learning a lot um, in the Championship, but, I mean, yeah, the next season, I, I, I didn't actually play as much as what I, I wanted to or felt I should have, but... Um, yeah, we bounced straight back up. We won the league, and it was just yeah, it was great to be a part of. To be fair, yeah. And at the start of the season in League One, um, Brian Gunn, obviously someone that's been really good to you, gets sacked just after beating Yeovil, didn't he? After yeah, that's winning right, the game, yeah. which is a little bit strange. And Paul Lambert replaces him. Um, how did things change under under Paul Lambert? Because like you say, um, Brian Gunn was good for you. He's well liked around Norwich, well known that sort of thing. How different was it? Um, yeah, it was it was it was a big change. I, I, I mean, Paul Lambert hadn't had um, a lot of well, we, he, he was obviously a well respected player and that, and he, he was a manager at Colchester, so we didn't really know much about him as a manager. But he was top draw to be fair to him when he, as soon as he come in, um, training got stepped up a level to be fair, and that wasn't again anything against Brian Gunner or anything. It was just the way that he implemented things. He wanted. He wanted us to be out on the training pitch for no longer than an hour and 15 minutes, but we would be going 100% for the whole time. And that's how his training would be from Monday to Friday. When you're out on the training pitch, that's it. We'll, we'll go we'll go for it, but you won't be out here for too long. So um, I think the fit, that, that definitely helped the fitness levels, the sharpness levels. Um, and yeah, it was just the, the training was enjoyable as well along the way, you know. He knew where the line was that you couldn't cross. You know that he'd have a bit of banter with you when he could, but 
also when you stepped onto that pitch you knew that there were, there had to be a job to be done and um and we we, we all fully were aware, aware of that so it was good Paul Lambert managed because didn't Norwich they got hammered by Colchester first game, didn't they? Paul Lambert was coach of Colchester at the time. It was, we lost seven one at home to Colchester the first day of the season, which was in itself was a I think a big shock. Yeah. It was a big coupon buster, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We we um I think we was probably one of the favourites to get promoted straight away. Colchester were obviously a, a decent club, but I don't think anyone would have expected that. And then, like say, a couple of days later, we went to Yeovil, we won, and then the next day. Brian Dunn got sacked so in that respect it was a bit harsh but in the long run you know the club made a decision they brought Paul Lambert in and he got back to back promotions to the Premier League so uh, no one can really grumble at the decisions they made in, in the long run but although it's not nice at the time seeing someone who you liked and respected being sacked but um, unfortunately that's the game we live in and um, that's just how it rolls really in football unfortunately Yeah yeah, I was going to say I suppose in the end it did, it did pay off in like you say, you, you won the league the following year, League One, straight back up. Um, yeah. How was it? How was it winning the league? What's what's the feeling around it? It's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just really good to share that situation with the people that you work with every day, and it's almost like it's just a massive relief that you've sort of come so far together, and at the end of the season, you've got something to celebrate. I mean, yeah. I've been a part of, since then. I haven't had a promotion or anything like that, so I haven't. I haven't had that feeling again, unfortunately. It's just a feeling. It's just to share with your friends and the fans, and it's it's just almost you feel like you're giving something back, you know, because obviously the club show a massive faith in you, and the fans they back you home and away every week, and it's just nice to be able to share something with them. So it's a great feeling. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember. Like obviously, Dan Priestfield in 2013 winning the league. Like, it was mental, and like being a player and like knowing you've achieved it as well inside the club. Like not just for the fans, but it's like setting out to achieve your aim sort of thing. You've done it. It's, yeah, exactly, must, exactly. Must I mean, at the start of the season, every club should be setting out to gain promotion. If you're not, then what's the what's the point in taking part? So, yeah. for the, for the three, five team, four teams that do get promoted either every season, it's it's just. A, the best feeling, honestly, that you can. It's just a, it's just a massive relief at the end of it. Like we've done it, you know. And it was, unfortunately, I haven't felt that again. But who knows in the future? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then, the move, move to Gillingham the first time. Why, why, why? Are you, first of all, why are you going out on loan? And second of all, why Gillingham? So, um, the reason I went out on loan was Paul Lambert had made it quite clear that I wasn't going to play every week. Yeah, he, he was like, look, you'll you'll be a part of the team. That, that was one of the, the biggest things that I respected about Paul was that he was the most honest manager that I've come across to date. He will tell you if you're doing something good. He will tell you if you're doing something wrong. Yeah. If you're doing something that you shouldn't be, you know, and he'll, he'll explain why you ain't playing, why you was playing and, and all that. And it was, and, and he just pulled me at the start of pre-season and said, look, he said, you're, you're a great lad, but you're not going to play as much as what, you probably want to this year. We're looking at bringing someone in. There's a possibility that they might want to take someone. Is that something that you might consider? Okay. So, Paul, um, let's, what team is it to start with? And he sort of said Gillingham because they were looking at Simeon. Then we was actually we was actually in pre on pre season tour in Germany, and um, he pulled me and he said, "Look, he said, he said you've you've hit the ground running in pre season." I remember it clearly. He was like, "I've I've been racking my brains what to do." He's like, "But we sort of had Simeon in line from last season." He's like, "If you don't want it, he said we can still get the deal over the line, but that's probably going to push you even further down the pecking order." Yeah, and I respected that. It was it was honest, and it was and and I I wanted to be playing every week. So um, I know when you are playing, you've got a you've got a hold down your place. But I'd, I'd have backed myself if I was playing to, but to sort of hear that you you got three possibly four strikers in front of you yeah um, it was a little bit tough but like I say I respected it and I was in Germany and I, fl- and I, I said yeah no I said I'll go out on season for a loan uh, go out on loan for a season um, and yeah so I flew home from Germany and the next day I was meeting Andy Hessen Tyler and Ian Hendon and then yeah, it was it was literally done that evening. I think. Yeah, I know. I know. Obviously, different different styles complement different players, but on paper, like 
I would have loved to have seen Colin McDonald, Simeon Jackson playing together. That would have been, that'd have been brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I've had a few people say that to us, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's a shame it never did happen, to, uh, to be honest. I've, I went back and done pre-season the following year with Simeon as well, and he was a, he was a great lad, great finisher, great footballer. Yeah. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, we never we never got the chance to play with each other. But yeah, that would have been something I'd have enjoyed, actually. Yeah, yeah that would have been brilliant. Yeah. Um, so Gillingham had just been relegated. They've lost their main man, obviously, like you say, Simon Jackson, part of the deal. Um, yeah. Did you sort of want to be that main man for Gillingham? Then was that the aim? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I, I sort of took it upon myself to think that you know this is a great opportunity to go out and either I, I know it's two leagues lower, League Two to Championship, but I was like, right, I'm going to go out and prove that I can do it at this level because. Although I'd played in the Championship of League One, I hadn't played every week and scored a lot of goals up until that season with Gillingham. So it was really my chance to, right, come on, it's the big season for me. Yeah. Go and prove that I should be playing at that level and and, and go and do what I knew I could do. So, um, yeah, from the off, it was just a, it was the perfect move for me at the time because I got to move back with my family as well. We was living up in Norwich, so just everything sort of just fitted into place as soon as I, I, I signed that season long loan at, at Gillingham. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of, before we come on to sort of personal accolades and records and that, um, the team just missed out on the playoffs that year on, on goal <coughs> difference, um, losing losing three, three of the last four, I think it was, and sort of yeah um, a bit of a gutting finish. But how, how was that season overall from a team perspective and how gutting was it to miss out on the playoffs? Well, it was it was very ups and downs to be fair because yeah. I, I remember around the stage where we lost to Dover in the FA Cup. Yeah, it was like it was it was an awkward place to be around because there was so many angry people and it was like it was it was a you're coming into work every day and you're like oh, this place is like the proper downer around. But that's that's just the, the highs and lows of football. When you're not doing well, then that that's what that brings. And but great credit to the gaffer Hesse at the time and Hendo and they made a few changes they brought a new f- few new faces in and and the squad they picked themselves up and we had a we had a bit of a bash towards the end of the season but like you say I, I, I couldn't remember that it was three out of the last four that we lost but I remember we had great momentum going in towards the end of the season and we, we actually felt that if we can sneak in the playoffs we'd have a great opportunity to get promoted because generally you find that the team that's hitting the form towards the end, the late runners, they're the ones that can go on and, and win the playoffs. So, massive, um, massive heartbreak for us and the club when I think it was 3 1 we lost to Chesterfield on the last day. Yeah. Um, having, we, we got back in the game, I think I scored in that game, made it 1 all. There was only 15 or so, so minutes to go, and we're thinking, come on, let's hold on for a draw. And I, I think we conceded two latest goals, but. Like you say, it's, it's, that's the highs and lows of football. You've got to take, you've got to take them on the chin when they come. But obviously, at the time, it's not nice. But you just got to try and put that behind you and just, just think of the next season, really. Yeah, yeah. I remember, like you say, that Dover game because I remember I spoke to Matt Fish recently and he was at Dover at the time and he was saying, like, yeah, he was. Yeah, he thought he thought Hess was in trouble, really. But like you say, he turned it around and then um, it was a shame, shame we missed out. But in terms of um, a personal season for you. It was a brilliant season for you. I think it was twenty five goals. Um, yeah, that season. Um, how was it for you, and why? Why did it click? Um, I think a lot of things really. Like, like I've mentioned, I, I got to, I got to move back home. It's no secret that whenever I've been at home, I've played my best football. Yeah. Um, obviously, the team playing up front with Bayo. Um, I was playing every week. I always backed myself like. Um, a lot of them games that I scored goals, I probably might not have played as well as what I, I wanted to, but I just always felt that if I was on the pitch for 90 minutes, I'd get that one chance and I'd score a goal. And that's just how a few of my goals come about. But, you know, some teams you won't get that. But Hesse backed me fully. He, he played, I, I don't think I ever got subbed. I think I played every game. And it was just one of them. Like I remember he said to me one game, I think it was away at Burton Albion. I think we drew one on. Yeah. And uh, Hendo pulled me, he said, for the first time over, he said, Hesse actually said to me, we're going to have to take Cody off today, he's not at it. And then literally, I think within five minutes, I've scored goal of the season, I think, where I flicked it over the 
the, the fella's head and volleyed it in the top corner and, yeah. and he just looked at him and went oh my god like <laughs> that was just how some of the games went but I was still learning then I was still 22 I was new to the pro game um, and I learned a lot of things that season I learned how to link up play how to hold the ball up better because I was always really just a runner getting behind but the game changed around that time the game was changing um, and I had to learn to hold the ball up better, link up play with my striker, and that's that's where it just clicked with Bayo, and I learned a lot of him how to do that. So that yeah. was a massive, massive step in the right direction as as respect to my career for longing and and going forward. Yeah, I say like as long as you're as long as you're working hard and you've got that 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 ability, like you can you can always come out of a goal at any at any point. So it's it's obviously yeah. a good thing to do and. Like you say, working with Bayo, um, I want to touch on that because I think if people think Cody McDonald, Gillingham and Strikers, I know you've got like Kedwell, John Marquise, that sort of thing, but most yeah. people would probably say Akin Fenwa. Um, what was your partnership like with him from your point of view? Because obviously it went really well. Oh, great. It was just, you, you know, the biggest thing with Bayo is that um, you'd give him the ball and you knew if you make a run, he will find you. Yeah. Whether it's with his head, he'll chest it, he'll hold it, he'll lay it off to you. And that's just the confidence that we had. No matter where we was on a pitch, we just knew how to find each other. And it was just... And I think also as well that people don't maybe don't really... Well, they know that he's a handful, but they, the defenders are so fixed on him and worried about him, his strength and his power and his his ability to score goals that they, they almost used to just forget about me. Yeah. So it, it sort of gave me free reigns to just... Uh, the amount of times I must have got in in behind in that season was just frightening from him flicking the ball on where both centre halves are going in to tackle him and he's just holding them off and flicking it and it was just yeah it was just one of them dream partnerships if you if if, if you can say that from my point of view because you just knew that if you give the ball to him it'll stick and, and he'll find you whatever whatever run you make so it just clicked from the off it it wasn't something that we spoke about off the pitch and we was like right we've got to do this we've got to do that it was just one of them it just it just happened and whenever we did play together it just worked so um, yeah it was a great great point of my career playing up front with Bayo definitely yeah, and I think a lot of people. I know he's got the whole um, the whole thing that he's always stuck by. Like people have said, he's too big to play football and that sort of thing. And now I know he's older, but people still sort of say like, "Oh, he's just a lump. He's just strength." But even watching him play now for Wickham, like you forget how good he is and how good he is at what he does. So I think he. Oh yeah, he's... The, the, the the thing with Bayo there. I know he's a bit younger then. He's a little bit older now, but he could actually move a bit as well. Once he got going, and he could put a shift in, and he was fit. He he could move about, and he. he... He'd cover some yards as well for a big lad, but yeah. although he wasn't in the team for that, um, he would still put in a shift for his team because he he wanted to do as well as everyone else. So, um, but yeah, just a just a dream to play up front with. Like I say, the ball would just stick, and you just knew you was getting it back. So it's just it was perfect for me at the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then obviously. Following season, I mean, I think every Dreamland fan wanted you back, that sort of thing. But I know League Two still, um, obviously, maybe another year older, another year experience. You get your first sort of, fe- fe- say, your first sort of full season um, under your belt of consistent games, that sort of thing, in, in the professional game. And you get the move to Coventry. Was that just a matter of sort of trying to play as high as you could, sort of thing? No, it wasn't really. I actually wanted the move to Gillingham, but it was sort of out of my hands in the fact that. Um, Norwich had a set price for me they wanted X amount yeah. and Gillingham just couldn't pay it at the time so that that move was just out the window from, from the get-go really even though we did try to push it through a little bit but Norwich were being quite stubborn with what they wanted and they wasn't going to move on that because I, I'd spoke to Paul Lambert again and, he, and he'd said look I know we're up a league now we're in the Premier League same, same similar conversation as before you've gone out you've done great um, you're not going to play every week, but if we don't get what we're asking for you, I'm not going to completely bomb you off. You'll be in and around the squad and all that. So they were setting how much they wanted for me. Up until the night before I actually signed for Coventry, I was going to Watford for a few days. It was all set up. I spoke to Sean Dyche and it, it, the medical was all due to go there. But then Coventry come in late for a uh, outbid Watford. And then, yeah, so I, I, I literally had to change my... Well, I didn't have to change my mind. That was just where I got sent basically yeah fair enough <laughs> um, so I just went and had the medical the, the following day after that but it was yeah that was that was another crazy time really and how was how was it to start over at Coventry because I think the first year was the relegation year wasn't it 
Yeah, so uh, the championship wasn't hitting me very nicely, was it? Yeah. <laughs> I had two championship seasons and two yeah. relegations, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was there was a lot of issues at the club off the pitch as well. There was, um, yeah, we had we had a two or three different managers through the course of the season, and you know we had a great squad there, but we just never we just couldn't. The longer the season goes on, it's harder to make uh, regain that. Um, momentum and it was we were just we were in such a rot from losing early on every week that we just couldn't get ourselves out of that even though we was picking up the odd good win we just couldn't really put a little run together to get us out of trouble so um, yeah unfortunately the the dreaded relegation happened uh, for me again but again it was it, it was one of them things you've got to just you have a little sulk for a few days and then you sort of just get out get out of your out of your mind and think right come on think of the positives let's go again another challenge for next season and we'll try and get promoted again yeah yeah and what were the ambitions going into the following year were they literally just to go straight back up yeah I mean there's got to be hasn't it I mean yeah. like I touched on earlier if if you're not starting the season to either at least be in the playoffs I mean every team should set out the start of the season to win the league realistically there's teams in the league that are never going to do that but I mean, if you don't set them standards and you set out for them goals, then what is the what is the point in taking part? You know. Yeah, there's, yeah. You go into win every game, didn't you? Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah. So we we had a good pre season the, the following year as well, and the place was really positive, and we felt that we could get promotion again straight away. But a similar sort of thing happened as what happened at Norwich. The, the manager got backed all through pre season, three or four games in, got sacked. So it was. It was almost like turning the clock back to, the, to a few years before for me, because it yeah. was another person who I respected very highly and um, enjoyed working under. Uh, was being sacked again, so it was it was it was a tough time again. But like like touched on, it does happen, and I've learned that more so now since then because it was obviously hard at the start that these things do happen, and um, you just sort of got to dust yourself down and and try and do what you can for the club. And the fact you came back on loan to Gillingham that season, I mean, we'll touch on that in a minute, but was that a managerial yeah. situation, the change of manager? Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was... It was It was. a weird one, really, because I was doing quite well, and then we had another change of manager. Um, I think I picked up a little injury. I, I had, like, a, a runner's knee. It was, like, I basically just used to have an injection on the side of my knee every now and then. Yeah. The surgeon I'd gone to see to have it done didn't do it properly. And you can't have so many in your knee, so I had to wait for it to heal properly itself yeah. without having an injection. So I was, like, out for a couple of months and then, yeah, just struggled to get a bit of momentum, a bit of confidence and... Um, obviously lost a little bit of fitness and that and just really struggled to get back in the team and then um, Mark Robbins left to go to Barnsley I think and we got a new new manager in and then I just my agent phoned me and said look Gillingham looking for a striker Martin Allen's been on the phone wants to meet you tomorrow and I, I, I went yeah I said I'll go and meet him so I drove to a services I think we drove about halfway met in the services on the Sunday and uh, on the Monday, yeah, I was I was there on loan. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't there long. I think it was five weeks. I think I I, I intended to join till the end of the season, um, but after a month or five weeks, I got recalled. So I had to go back to Coventry and do the last two months of the season back there. So um, I missed out on all the partying and the celebrations at the end, which was a bit gutting. Yeah, I didn't get a trophy or anything either, so that was a little bit gutting. But I played a part in it. I scored a few goals in that little little time that I spent there. So um, I felt like I I played my bits, which which was nice. Yeah, you know, I remember uh, it was seven games or something. I remember you coming on against York. I think it was the first game back, and I remember um, you scoring that game. And I just remember like the feeling. Yeah, that was great. I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure was it one all Miles Western cutting on the left. Whipped it in and I headed it in yeah. the back yeah, yeah, I remember that's the header, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. And we went on a nice run, but you said you got recalled. Did Did you want to go back? Because like you say, you were meant to no, be there for the season. No, I didn't. But unfortunately, in them situations, if the club have a recall on your loan, there's not a lot you can really do. You can plead with them and say, oh, come on, can I stay? Yeah. Um, but I think Lee Carsley had just taken over. I think the manager had just been sacked again. 
at Coventry. Lee Carsley had just took over and he phoned me. He's like, look, he's, we could really do with you at the minute, mate. And I said, sort of said, look, I'm, I'm really enjoying my time. You know, I'm back home with my family and that. He's like, no, he said, look, I need you back here, mate. So, yeah, so I just went back and spent the last two two months of the season back at Coventry before trying to set up the, the following season to push through a permanent to Chillingham. So um, it all worked out well in the end. Yeah, definitely. And I know, like you say, you only played a few games and you missed out on all, all the end stuff, but how was it seeing Gillingham win the league? Because you did play your part. Yeah, it was a great feeling. Obviously, we, we've we talked about before the, the season, a couple of seasons before, where we just missed out on the playoffs. And um, Obviously, I had a great season there, so it was something that um, I always kept an eye on. I'm, I'm really good friends with Stuart Nelson as well, and he was obviously... I didn't play with him the first season, but he was he was at Gillingham at the time, so we yeah. we was keeping in contact and um, so yeah, I was I was I was buzzing for the club, the a few of the players that I still knew and that it was it was a great time for the club and then also from a from a selfish personal point of view as well, I was thinking look, the club's in League One now that that's going to help my chances to try and get my move to go there and then play League One football every week because. Coventry were in League One anyway, so it's not like I'd be dropping out down a league or. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a win win from my point of view, really. And what was the process of pushing through the permanent move? Um, not not a great deal, really. I, I can't even remember who the manager was at Coventry at the time, and I just sort of we had our end of year meeting, and. Uh, there, there was there was issues with money at the club anyway, and they were trying to get people off the wage bill. And he sort of said, "Look, he said we need to free your money up. Will you take a wage deduction and all this and all that?" And I was like, "I, I just I was just honest with him to be honest. I just said, look, I, I, I want to leave. I, can I leave if I if I can get the right club? Can I can I leave?" And they just sort of agreed to it. They just said, "Yeah, if you if you get the right move, we won't stand in anyone's way." So. Um, yeah, so I got straight on the phone to my agent and said, "Look, can we try and set this up?" Yeah, it, it took a while actually because that was that was at the end of the the League Two Chillingham winning the league season, and I didn't sign for them until it was a good two weeks into pre season. So it was a good two and a half months after. Yeah, I mean everyone broke away on the holidays and that, and it was a little bit. And I was still under contract, so I wasn't I wasn't scrambling around for another club. So it was a little bit more relaxed still. But then once pre season started, I just I just said, look, come on, let's just try and get this done now. And then, thankfully, my agent at the time um, got a deal done between Coventry and Gillingham, and the rest is history, as they say. And I know it was it was only brief when you were there on loan, and then I know it was only brief um, when he was there after you joined permanently. But how were things under Martin Allen? Yeah, very good. He was um, he was an enjoyable person to. Um, play under actually he'd give you a full license to just go and enjoy yourself he's a great character off the pitch he'd have some great laughs but again like Paul Lamb but he'd be honest with you he'd pull you he'd tell you if he's doing anything wrong and also he'd, he'd pull you and he'd make you feel so good because you, you knew if you got pulled on a Monday and you felt you'd have a game a good game at the weekend you'd sort of go in his office and you'd be high hopes like an all confident that and he'd, he'd just look at you and go how good was you the other day and he'd sort of make, he'd make you feel so good, good about yourself and yeah. just just build your confidence up and he'd just put his arm around your shoulder and just make remind you of how good you can be you know and he was he was great at getting the best out of people and again but that was unfortunately that didn't work out in the end but like we say that things sometimes people need to move on to um get the best out of each other and unfortunately that happened again with Martin but um, great character on and off the pitch and um, I still speak to him now actually oh, yeah. um, still keep in contact and still speak to each other so that's that's great as well it's funny because what you, what you just said that's exactly what Kedwell said like when he'd pull you and be like oh how good were you that sort of thing so that's oh yeah that's honestly nice you, you, but on, on the flip side if you sort of thought oh I could have done better the other day or I wasn't quite at it and you got the call Monday morning, you'd be like, oh, he's going to bat him here. <laughs> <laughs> I remember he pulled me one day, we, we'd just done pre-season, and all pre-season's game, you're looking sharp, you're looking fit, like, you don't need to do all this running and all that, you're yeah. looking fit, you're looking sharp, and then after the first game he pulled me, he went, you know, we're near it, you're not fit enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I was like, Oh, you was telling me the other day I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I get the vibe that if, perhaps if things aren't going great, he's probably not the best manager to be around in terms of, like, 
it's criticism. Yeah, he's, he's, he, was, he, was, he was a good man to be around in general. Yeah. Like I said, on and off the pitch, he's a great character and yeah, he's just, he's good to be around. Yeah. And obviously that, that was the first year back in League One and I know he only lasted sort of a couple of months or so, but Peter Taylor came in, we stayed up. Um, how, did, how did Taylor change things around the club? Well, training changed a lot because we went from doing a lot of high intensity stuff to we was going into a lot of shape so we were a lot more disciplined we started grinding results out 1-0 and um, we started picking up a few results it was, yeah it was a lot more solid um, yeah. we just done a lot of shape really it was just yeah I, I think things like the food and that changed as well um, obviously the diet and that yeah as well, had uh, changed a little bit under Peter, but it was no, it was it was it was an enjoyable time again. Like I say, I, I've been very lucky. Whenever I've been at Gillingham, I've always I've always played. Really, there's been the odd games where I've been sub, but generally, I've always my name's always been on the team sheet, and that's when I've played my best football, and that's when you're enjoying it when you're playing every week. So that's yeah. I think generally why I played my best football when I was at Gillingham because I was playing every week. So. Um, and that was no change under Peter. He was he was he was a good man to be around when you win it. when you lose when you lost he he he'd tell you and he'd he'd proper give you a rollicking or whatever, but um there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. Some I think the game's changed a little bit as in you've got to, um you gotta work your players out before you batter some of them, but um yeah, I didn't mind it all being shouted at if we done something wrong because I think at the end of the day, if you're not doing your job, then why can't why shouldn't you be told? But like I say, some people can't handle that. But um, Peter Taylor definitely didn't have any qualms about telling you. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I was going to say I get the vibe that like, I've never, obviously never been a footballer, but I get the vibe that if you're playing week in week out, it's a lot easier to get some form rather than if you're playing ten minutes here, ten minutes yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I found that even more so a bit later on in my career more recently when I was at Wimbledon you know um, Neil Hardley another great manager real nice person he loved to rotate the squad and you you play well one game and then the next game you, you're you not in the team and you're like oh, what's going on here and he'd pull you and say yeah I'm just freshening things up and you're like oh, I want to try and get a bit of momentum here but yeah. my confidence is sky, sky high I'm scoring and then I'm not playing so um, but yeah I mean any footballer that tells you that they're when they're on the bench they don't mind is lying, I think. So, um that's that's not enjoyable when you're sitting on the bench every week. So, um when you're playing every week, you're enjoying your football more so and you, and that's gonna bring the best out of you. So, um that's what I found mainly in, in that in that spell at Gillingham. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um and like I say, we, we stayed up and then the following year Another manager change, um, Taylor Sacks, you have the gang of four for a little bit, and then Justin Edinburgh comes in. Um, yeah. Finished 2014-2015 nicely, sort of mid-table finish. Um, you sign the new contract. And then we have yep. the infamous, I suppose, 2015-2016 season. Um, I know you had a bit of an injury that year. Um, yeah. And I think most people would probably associate the strike force that season with Dominic Samuel, Roy Donnelly, and then Bradley Dakin behind. But you, like I yeah. said, you're obviously around the club playing playing games as well. Um why, yeah. why did it start so well that year? What do you think the secret was? I think that, I, I've got to be honest, that was the toughest pre-season I've ever had. We were just all so fit, yeah. super fit, super sharp. We was well drilled. He obviously, his recruitment was spot on. He brought the right players in. Um, and I think we surprised a lot of teams. I think a lot of teams thought, oh, little old Gillingham, like Sheffield United first day of the season, I bet they thought, ah, Gillingham, we'll, we'll steamroll these today and then all of a sudden they're up against a team that's fit, strong, powerful, you know, and we had some good players, we had some really good players that season and, and we scored a lot of goals and yeah, we just, I think I think we surprised a lot of teams, but yeah, they just, um, Justin and Kurz, they just got it, they got it right from pre-season really, like with the fitness stuff. Like I say, it wasn't enjoyable at the time, but you felt so good after pre-season. You felt so fit and strong and powerful. Um, so no, that, I think that was a, that was a big part of it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think everyone remembers that game against Sheffield United, and the, I think it was a few games in. I can't remember who we beat, but I remember saying to a friend after, like, I don't think we were great. And I think we won one nil, and I was just thinking, like, we can play bad and still win. Like this is a happy yeah. days here. Um, yeah, that's a sign of a good team. That yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think. 
obviously we went on to finish ninth that season. I think we were top at Christmas. Um, like I say, I know you had the injury, but I think it was the game on TV against Wigan where we threw away the two 0 lead. Um, yeah. So sort of maybe trigger a change in momentum. Um, what went wrong, and why didn't we finish at least in the playoffs that season? Do you think? I think going back to what we were saying earlier, I just think that we was on such a high, and then all of a sudden we were on a bit of a low. It's hard to get yourself out of that little rot that you 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 sort of going down, and, and then you start panicking, start thinking, "Oh Jesus!" Like yeah. we might not even make the playoffs here. And then once once little things like that start creeping in your mind, it's hard to it's hard to get them out. And then all of a sudden you'll go one nil down, and you're like, "Oh, here we go again." Are we going to lose again? We're going to miss out on the playoffs, and, we're, uh, and I, I just, I just think that's what it was in the long run. I, I mean, overall, we deserve to be at least be in the playoffs that season because we was a, a lot of teams that I come up against even after that, and players that I've come across, they was like, "Are oh, you by far the best team we played that year?" Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the game, the game I got injured, we played away at Millwall, and yeah. we won three nil. Yeah. And I spoke to uh, Paul Robinson when I. Uh, signed for Wimbledon and he went honestly he said I, I thought we were playing against Barcelona that day he <laughs> said you were unbelievable he said you was by far the best team we played that season so that's that's just football again and it? it just shows when you're on a high everything you touch just goes to gold but when unfortunately when things ain't going against you you don't get the rub of the green and you think everyone's against you and it's all that's yeah again that's another that was another hard one to take that season knowing how good we was all season but just to miss out on the last day as well but yeah yeah like you say we were in it until the last day weren't we that game against Millwall and I think yeah against Millwall yeah Does and, we, and we was we was ultra positive I know we was relying on another result but we was positive that we could we could get our side side of the deal done and things could go our way but I, I think the other result didn't go our way in the end anyway but um, yeah yeah, like we say, that was a tough one to take it, Graham. But like we say, this, this is football. You gotta, you gotta take these things because they're gonna, they hit you hard. They do hit you hard. But you, you gotta when the, when the good times come, you gotta, you gotta appreciate them as well. Yeah, I think I think there was a point, um, like I say, about momentum. When I think we were still in the top six, and we sort of said like, I don't think we're gonna make it anymore because of like momentum. And um, but I think the season still, at least in my mind, anyway, it's, it remains in positive spirits, and I think. A lot of people have said since, obviously, sadly, Justin Edinburgh passed away, that he allowed us to dream again, and like we were top at Christmas, that sort of thing, and it still, it still keeps, it still has positive memories in my brain. Obviously, it, it ended on a bit of a low, but it was still a brilliant season. Um, yeah, hundred percent. It was a great. It, like you say, it was for ninety percent of that season. It was, it was unbelievable. We was like the surprise package that no one thought that we could go and do it. But like you say, unfortunately, we fell short in the end. But it was a great ride whilst it lasted, as they say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, then yeah. the following season didn't really go to plan, and obviously Justin Ed- Edinburgh departs. Um, I think yeah. some people were maybe shocked because we knew he was a good manager. He'd done well at Newport. He'd done well at most, pretty much every club he'd been at, and um, he'd done well the season he came in and to get us a twelfth place finish. Obviously, we we were top for a long time. I think maybe people thought it was just a dip in form. But what was the feelings inside the dressing room when he left? Um. There was disappointment because again he was a, he was a well respected person. Everyone liked him. Out of all the managers I've played under, I'd probably say that he was the most enjoyable in the fact that coming to work every day, he had a great balance between banter and going to work. Um, and, and again, I, I think that's the difference between the good managers and the bad managers. He he knew off the pitch where we could have a bit of fun and a laugh. When we when we got on that training ground, everything was bang on. The sessions were good, and I think that's what made him such a good manager. But like you say, we, I think a lot of the reason why uh, he ended up getting sacked, I think, I think the form from the season before, we just carried that on. Yeah, and we never we never really got out of that little rot that we was in. We had a, we had a decent little cup run. I think we beat Watford, and we yeah. got obviously the game at White Hart Lane, which was obviously a massive. Massive high for the club and for Justin himself at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we wasn't we wasn't doing great in the league to be honest. And um, yeah, I think that was just a, a follow on effect from the, the season before, really. Yeah, I think I think he he brought in the likes of um, of Joe Emmanuel Thomas, didn't he? Billy Knott, Paul Konchesky, that sort of thing. And I remember the game. Yeah. The game against Southend at Roots Hall on the first day. 
I remember <coughs> you and Jay out front, that sort of thing. I was like thinking, oh, what strike force, what a team, that sort of thing. But it, yeah. did, it didn't work. We managed to keep keep hold of Dak as well, obviously, which. I think the club might miss down a bit of money doing that, keeping him for the extra year. But obviously, you want to you want to try and get, get keep your best players as much as you can. Yeah, but, um, of, course. of course. Yeah, like you say, maybe it was a matter of just that that poor that poor form carrying on. Um, seems like what it was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what that was. To be honest, yeah. Yeah, and then obviously, Ad Pennant comes in. I think I think it's obvious now, looking back, that the the target was to just keep us up because we were in terrible form and we're flirting with relegation. Um, I know he started talking about the playoffs, but. Um, in the press and that, but I suppose every manager's got to say that. What was he saying to you guys when he came in? Just the same, really. Like he, he felt that he was like, "Oh, this is the best squad I've ever worked with." Like he, he was just a very positive person. He made you feel good about yourself, and he was just trying to get the spirits back up. And realistically, we knew we was never going to make the playoffs, but he sort of put that in our head and he gave us a target. And I think I'm I'm pretty sure that we set out little targets. I think it was every every ten games or, or so. I think. He set out a points total that we had to hit okay. to stay up. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was obviously really close in the end. It came down to the last day, but um, he got the job done. And then he obviously got the job on a permanent basis after that. So, um, all credit to him. What do you remember from that final day at Northampton? Because I think it's it's all a bit of a blur for me. I remember travel, travelling there, um, obviously standing behind the goal. Josh Wright misses a penalty with... We're waiting after full time. Um, people think Fleet would have scored against Port Vale, and then we're playing for a point. It's all a bit confusing. But what was it like for players? Yeah, so I, I just remember obviously the first half, um, Wrighty missing the penalty, and we actually we played quite well that first half, and we should have won the game. Really, we had yeah. we was the better team. I had a couple of half decent chances that I was disappointed with, um, but just. The second half went so quick; it was um, it was unbelievable. I literally felt like when you're coming towards the end of the game, you naturally you start to feel a little bit tired, and you sort of know that it's coming towards the end of the game. This game, I just felt like I was buzzing around, and then all of a sudden, it was like they were putting up three minutes injury time, and I was like, "What?" Yeah, it felt like I was out there like 15 minutes, and we're obviously we're, we're trying to win the game. We know a point would be enough, but if if results go away, but we're obviously trying to win the game, so we're chasing it a little bit, and you're like, "Oh." Like time's up. Like this is it. Like oh, how's the other game going? Because you don't actually know for definite. Yeah. And then just when the full time whistle goes, you we, obviously you was there. Um, you sort of standing around, and it was the longest. What was it? Two or three minutes? Four minutes? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was just the longest time, and I think the first time we knew, I think was when the fans started cheering. So then obviously we knew that we'd done it, and it was yeah. Again, it was even though it was just staying up and not getting promoted it was it was a great feeling because it's again it's just relief that you sort of you set yourself a little target a little while ago to stay up and you managed to do it so um, although it wasn't like you say you're winning the league and you're what have you but it, it was still a good feeling to stay up knowing that Gillingham will be playing League One football the following season yeah yeah definitely because yeah, I remember because uh, Bradley Dat was suspended wasn't he and he came out on his phone and everyone was gathering around and I don't think I think someone was Watching it on a betting app or something, and I think I think Fleetwood had a goal disallowed or something like that. And yeah, was, I think they did. Yeah, yeah, it was mental. But yeah, because well, I think because everyone was sort of like trying to scrap around for internet connection, and like some people get it before other people and that sort of thing, and then people were cheering. It's like they think we've stayed up with a point. Yeah, I just I just remember it. Was mental. <laughs> yeah, no, it like, was mental. It was mental. It just like you say, it's just all a bit of a blur, really. But it was it's a great feeling after. Yeah, and I, yeah, because I remember that I think the game against Bristol Rovers where. Obviously, I'm sure you're aware you got the two late goals. Um, yeah. And you got, like, there's still the picture of AD and Steve Lovell running down the pitch to hug you, that yeah. sort of thing. And I remember that, actually, because my season ticket used to be four rows up, and we were sort of scouting for a new seat a bit higher up in the rain amend, and we moved up, and, like, the it was the second goal, wasn't it? The one you put, put over the keeper. And, like, That's it, yeah. the silence yeah. from when the ball left your foot to when it goes in, everyone was going <laughs> mental. I always remember that. Because then we... We went on. I think we lost two, two, two after that. Because I remember the game at the Valley when that was that was not a good day. But um. oh, yeah, I remember that game as well. We lost quite bad, but we had. Well, I had so many chances. I don't think I've ever missed so many chances <laughs> in a game. I just couldn't believe. You know, it's just one of them games where you just, no matter what you've done, you was never going to score. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. But. Yeah, I just couldn't hit a barn door that day, but yeah, I do, I do remember that game actually. Yeah, I, I remember it because I think, I think I, I, I was confused at the start because I think didn't Lee Martin and Harry Cornick played wing back or something, 
And then um, yeah, I think they might have, yeah. Bradley Dat was playing deep and it weirded me out. And then I think the goals we conceded were quite poor. It was just a frustrating day. But then obviously, yeah, it was it was a frustrating day. Obviously against Charlton as well, but yeah, it didn't matter in the end. Really, the bit of pride on the line that obviously was dented a little bit. But in the long run, we we got the job done that we set out to do a few weeks before. So it was all good in the end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think. Um, a lot of people were gutted when you left at, at the end of that campaign because obviously you're you're in the top ten for all time record goal scorers at this point. I think it was eighty one goals or something like that. I know you spoke right. in the past about get wanting to get to a hundred. Um, yeah. How did the departure come around? Because I don't think I don't think you wanted to leave either, did you? No, I didn't. You sort of had your end of season meetings with the manager and. Um, the, the, obviously, he's made his decisions who he wants to keep and who he didn't want to keep and I sort of went in and he was like I don't know if I'm getting a job yet Cody so I don't know but if I do I want you to stay and I was like oh okay he was like I'll be in contact and I was like okay and then that was just left at that and he was like "Um, hopefully I'll see you soon yeah yeah (laughs) and then I sort of left and then I spoke to him over the phone he was like look I've got the job now but um we're we're um we're only going to offer you a year contract on x amount of money and it wasn't the money at all. I mean, I signed for Wimbledon on less money that I was getting off of the Gillingham. It was it was the pure fact that I, I I was 30 and I wanted a two-year contract. And, I mean, the biggest thing for me is my family and I just needed that little bit of security. And it was the hardest decision. I'll, I'll never forget, I was on holiday with my family and she was like, have you decided what you're going to do yet? And I was like, look, I said... This, these are the sort of things that I want to be doing. I want to be having holidays with you and I'm having fun. And and if, God forbid, something happens to me in a couple of years' time and I can't play football anymore, then we might not be able to do this. I said, so I need to I need to secure us a little bit more for for what it's worth now. So I just said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with it. I, I did try and plead with um, Adrian to try and get me get the chairman to change his mind and go to two years but they wouldn't budge so they, they just offered the one year and that was purely the only reason why I left because I just wanted a little bit more security with the two years Yeah, I think that was, it was similar with um, with Adebayak and Fenwell when he left Gillingham the second time because he only I think, he, I think I'm right in saying he only got offered a year and he wanted two years he was a similar sort of age aged what you were when you departed fans don't necessarily always understand the fact that you've got to have security for your family and that's important No, yeah, um, of course course don't get me wrong in the long run it didn't work out for me at Wimbledon and I might have been better staying at Gillingham and for the one season I might have done well enough to get another season another season after that but I mean until you sometimes make these decisions you you don't really know do you and I think obviously nothing against Wimbledon in the long run because it didn't work out there but it's it's a decision that I regret now but like I say at the time it felt like the right decision for me and my family and, and that's purely the only reason why I've done it yeah yeah definitely that's fair enough yeah, I was going to say it's sort of you only had a year at Wimbledon didn't you so you, in hindsight that could have been at Gillingham but obviously you didn't sign yeah. for a year at Wimbledon so that's, yeah. um, that's what you've got to think about um, just before we move on to the rest of your career what are your highlights from your time at Gillingham if you had to summarise it all I think I mean some the first one that comes into my head straight away is the goal against Wolves um, what about for you yeah to be fair that's 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 up there with a personal highlight, obviously playing a part in the season when the club got promoted. But just to be honest, just just I'm so honoured to have played for them because it's it's a great club, great support base, and it's like whenever whenever you're out on the pitch and the fans are all singing your name and that, it just gives you such a great feeling. And I just felt like I had a, such a good bond with the fans and the club, and just. Um, it was four or five years of my life where I just woke up every day and I just enjoyed going to work. So yeah. um, I'm thankful for the club for that. And it was, just, it, yeah, it was a shame that I didn't win more things with the club. But like I said, looking back on it now, I probably wouldn't change anything. Um, I wouldn't change anything now. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And I do want to talk about the games against Gillingham, but in, in general, how was the year at Wimbledon? Obviously just staying up, but... Um... Surviving obviously in a positive way. Um, how's the year for you? Um, yeah, not too bad. I played. I played quite a bit. Didn't score loads of goals. I can't remember how many goals I scored, but I, I just really struggled with the travelling. To be honest, I didn't really actually take into, uh, into consideration how far it was for me to travel. I thought it would be like an hour and a half a day, but the travelling was just killing me, and it yeah. was just yeah. I, I was sort of 
31, 30, yeah, 31 at the time, and I was I was sitting in the car for three hours in the morning, and I was getting out, I was training, and I was stiff, and I was like, this ain't fair, this ain't fair on the club, really, they're paying my wages to, and, and, and I wasn't giving them the best, so I just went into New Ireland, and I just said, look, I said, this ain't fair on you, it ain't really fair on me, because I'm just sitting in traffic constantly, yeah. every single day, literally three hours there, three hours back every day. And I just went, look, this ain't fair. You're paying me good wages to come and play football and I'm not giving you the best. So, um, basically, I want to leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like you mentioned earlier about um, playing your best football when, when you're living nearby and you feel settled at home, that sort of thing. So, yeah, travelling, obviously, isn't isn't ideal. Um, no, yeah. Do you remember Do you remember the two games against Gillingham that season? I do, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the first game was really strange because I thought it was nailed on I was thinking that, and, and I played on the Saturday and I played quite well and then we trained on the Monday I trained quite well and then he pulled me after he was like I'm not going to play you tomorrow code. and I was like what really <laughs> I'm playing against my old team like, I, 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 as much as I've enjoyed playing for them obviously I'm your player now so I, I want to do well against them all and yeah, I was really disappointed that I was I was so. And then yeah, the game the game at the Priestfield I played. I actually had a broken foot in that game. I had a bro- broken fifth metatarsal. I'd found out the day before. Right. Yeah. I had a broken fifth metatarsal, um, and I played. I, I played because we had Tottenham the following week at Wembley, and I was like, I can't miss that. I've got to just yeah get on with it. I just got yeah. to get on with it. So um, yeah, I think that was two all that game was it? Yeah, I think right you, you won a penalty, didn't you? I did, yeah. I got dragged down, but I was getting, I was getting a bit of jib off the fans actually. Yeah, <laughs> one, one of the fans uh, in the gorge, <laughs> stand, they were probably giving me jib, and I was like, "What?" And I actually got a picture, and I think I put it on my Facebook or something. Not long after of him pulling my shirt, and you can see all, all my underarm and that under my finger, he's dragging me oh, down. Right, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but yeah, but I had some good chances in that game actually as well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's weird because like I know. I know you're obviously a different player, but like where you'd won the penalty, I was just sort of a bit like, he's done that to us. Like, I oh, know. Yeah. And, yeah. and everyone, everyone still said to me, would, would you celebrate? And I was like, I wouldn't go crazy, but I wouldn't, because I think it's quite disrespectful for the team that you're playing for now, who pay your wages to just, I, I, w- I, w- I wouldn't have celebrated in a way where you sort of think, oh, that was out of order, Cody scoring against us. But I would, I would have just like, high five my teammates and things like that you know what I mean because I, I do I've, I've always felt that even when players do it now I think it's quite disrespectful to the team you play for now if you don't sort of show a bit of happiness you know what I mean so, yeah yeah. Yep. at the end of the day I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to I've, ne- I've, I've never wanted to but I wanted to win that day against Gillingham so I'm, I'm very rarely do I want Gillingham to lose but I wanted to win that day because I'm a competitive person and we obviously wanted to do well so it was uh, but yeah I think it was a good game overall that one actually yeah yeah, it, it was a good, good feeling going back and just sort of seeing the fans um, because I didn't get a chance to say bye properly really because obviously the season didn't know if I was staying or going so yeah. I never really got the chance to say bye to the fans and the club properly so that was nice in that respect and I must ask you, because me and my dad always talk about it, and he mentioned it to me when, when I told him I was doing this interview. The game at Kings Meadow when you came on, obviously, where the away fans are sort of on the side, just behind the dugout, and everyone was saying, you're Jills and you know you are. I yeah. feel like I remember you turned round and smiled. Did you or, or did you not? Yeah, probably, 100%. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I was probably deep down, I was probably loving all that, but I couldn't show it, could I? Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah, that was, um, that was a great feeling as well. I remember coming out at the start of the game, and I was on the bench, and I, you've obviously got to walk across the pitch, and uh, the Gillingham fans were singing it then, and, they were, and and I was like, deep down inside, I was like, oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Um, yeah. So, the, the move to Ebbsfleet, was it to do with something, something to do with being closer to home, was it? Yeah, mainly. I'd had, I, I'd had quite a lot of calls from teams that were up north, and I just, like I, like I said, I'm quite, well, I'm a family man, I've, I've I don't want my boys are like thirteen and eleven now, so I don't want to be moving them around. Yeah. It's not fair on them. So I, I was very limited to where I could go, and who I would I could play for as as full time football goes. So, um, Ebbsfleet come up. Gary and Ian Hendon was there, so I obviously knew Ian from 
uh, Gillingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he gave me a call and said, like, are you doing anything? Because I'd been training with Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, um, I remember, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd done a couple of weeks training with Cambridge. Um, and then, yeah, Hendo called me and said, look, do you want to come training? Just come for a couple of days. And similar to sort of Dartford, I suppose, I went training for a couple of days. I looked after myself, kept myself in shape and kept on top of my fitness and that and just sort of went in and done well with a couple of days and then signed for them. So, and, and and I enjoyed my time there, even though I didn't obviously got injured after a few months and had a bad injury. The club was great to me. Um, I know a lot of people off the pitch have got this um, sort of feeling around Ebbsfleet as whatever, but they, they were great to me and I thank them for that. Yeah. And aside from the injury, how was how was that season? Because there's, there's obviously a little playoff push. Yeah, we had some we had some great players there, a real good team, and again we was very the confidence was was buzzing. There was just there was a lot of um, football league players that are sort of a bit older, like myself. We obviously had Westy, Kedwell, yeah. um, Jack Payne was there. There was, there was, we had a good team there, and it was just, yeah, we, we was, we was smashing teams really, like four, three, fours, and fives, not every week, but a few times, and yeah, we just fell a bit short towards the end, just sort of fizzled out again, almost like the the Gillingham, Gillingham playoff campaign. Yeah, we like, we felt like we was going to get in the playoffs, and it just didn't quite happen. But it was very, very similar to the Gillingham situation. I missed the last two maybe three months because I had a knee operation um, yeah so I, I missed that last little push but I was obviously with the lads and that and watching and what have you but yeah. we just fell short again we will talk about the injury if that's alright I suppose it's obviously not not an ideal situation for you to talk about it but um, no of course the ACL injury doing against Hartlepool was it um, yeah Hartlepool it was yeah. Done. Did, did you know you'd done it straight away um, I knew I'd done something quite bad I, I knew I'd done something bad because it was a feeling I've never had before on the football pitch. It was just almost like you, you got that, you know, when people say, oh, did you get the popping feeling? I, I felt that and I landed very awkwardly, but it literally hurt for about 30 seconds. And then after I thought, oh, actually, it's not that bad. Yeah. And then when the physio come on, he was like, what, what are you saying? I was like, oh, I actually think it's all right. I'm not, I'm not sure. And I stood up and I was like, no, I think I'm all right. I think I'm all right. And I, I played on for 21 minutes. Yeah. Um, but then I literally I went to block the ball and as the ball hit the end of my foot and it sort of jarred up my leg and just hit my knee and just the pain was just ridiculous and then I even I even drove home after and everything and it wasn't until the next morning I woke up and I was in absolute agony and my knee just ballooned up and it was like stuck at 45 degrees I couldn't bend it I couldn't straighten it Right. I found the physio and he sorted out a scan for me straight away and I got my wife to drive me up to London that afternoon and before I'd even got home I'd had a phone call from the physio saying yeah you've unfortunately you've done your ACL and you've done quite a lot of damage so um, yeah that was it really and then within three weeks I was having an operation I must admit I, whenever I broke into like I felt like I was going to sprint it felt really weak and loose it felt like well, obviously the ACL is there to stop you hyperextending it yeah. And that exactly, looking back on it now, is exactly the feeling that I had was that I was going to hyperextend it and go the other way. And that was obviously because I had I had ruptured the ACL, but I, I didn't know at the time. But looking back on it, yeah, it was, probably wasn't ideal that I played on. But I, I spoke to the surgeon. He said, you wouldn't have made it worse. It was it was from the original impact that right. you've done it. So I didn't make it worse or anything. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um and like you said, Ebbsfleet were brilliant. If you had to summarise the, the whole rehab process, how was it? Um, it was it was tough and frustrating in the end because I I'd done so much of it and I was probably only two, maybe two and a half months away, from, yeah, about two months away from playing yeah. when I actually left Ebbsfleet. So I I'd gone basically a whole year doing a doing the rehab to getting so close and then obviously getting my contract terminated. So it was it was frustrating, but don't don't get me wrong, it's, it's it's a horrible injury and people generally say that this sort of injury is probably the, one of the worst you can have in football. Um, obviously your knees 
a big part of it. So yeah. it was tough. It was tough at times. The, the biggest the biggest thing that I felt was not the everyday going in the gym and working hard because I, I sort of I tried to pride myself on that as in take it into a positive as in look, I'll get myself really fit, strong and come back stronger and I, I, I tried to pride myself on that but the biggest thing that I struggled with was the lads were struggling on the pitch and I felt that I could help but I couldn't yeah yeah. I yeah. felt that I could have played a part I could have helped them on the pitch but I, I obviously couldn't because I was injured and that was that was the frustrating part on my half was that I felt I could have helped them but unfortunately that wasn't meant to be but yeah we'll hopefully hear in the next few days what happens but I'm hoping that they stay up because I know like I like just said that people have got their impressions and opinions of them on the, off the pitch but they, they were they were great to me they they give me an extra year's contract when they when they knew I wasn't going to play probably for most of that season yeah um, so all credit to them Gary Hill um, they really looked after me in that respect and they 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 give me the opportunity to hopefully play football again next season so uh, we'll see where we go with that yeah and I just want to ask I'm not sure if you're if you're someone that's sort of struggles with this sort of thing but how do you deal mentally with the injury and obviously you've had something taken away from you that you love and like you say you wanted to be out there but you physically can't um yeah like I say that uh, I'm quite a positive person I, in, in life general I'm one of them people that everything happens for a reason yeah uh, yeah and, and I can get my head around things like that like I say the, the toughest thing that I I struggled to deal with was that that I I felt that I could have helped the team a lot but I physically wasn't able to. And that was, I tried to do my best off the pitch with motivating them and being around the lads all the time and trying to help some of the younger lads. But it's not the same as when you're on the pitch and you're encouraging people and trying to get people going. But um, like I say, yeah, but the, the mental side of it, I, I think I dealt with that quite well. Um, like I say, cause it can be hard just being stuck in the gym every day because you go through ups and downs. You sort of, you, you feel like you're never going to play again because your knee feels so bad. You're just thinking, how am I ever going to play football again after I, I can literally barely walk? Yeah. And, then you, and then you're trying to do a squat and you're like, I can't even squat now. How am I going to be able to play football in six months' time? And then you sort of get over little hurdles and you set yourself, like we set ourselves little targets every month to hit. And then I knew that if I was hitting them targets, then we were on track, so... Um, yeah, I was sort of taking it week to week, and and hopefully trying to hit them targets every month, which we was. But it weren't meant weren't meant to be in the end. But yeah, still, um, it, I, I dealt with it okay. Yeah, and I understand it was probably a bit frustrating to leave obviously at the time. But like you said, you were so close to being fit, and I think you had a clause in the contract that you had to be fit by a certain point, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I I had to I had to play by the end of January, which. In hindsight, I was never going to do because they the, the surgeon that I was dealing with was saying that it's a 12-month injury. Players that come back sooner are generally Premier League players. They've got every single facility that you need yeah. day in, day out, which we at Ebsfleet didn't have. So he's, he said that 12 months, really, and 12 months post-op would have took me to March, March, really, middle of March. So realistically, I was never going to do that. But when they put that in my clause, I, I didn't really have an option. I was, I was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. We'll try and do it then. But yeah, which which didn't quite do it in the end. And I know it was only sort of the start of this year, but um, how's the injury now, and what have you been up to since you left Ebbsfleet? Um, so Callum Green, the physio there, he's been top draw. He's stayed in contact with me. He's been doing me programs and that. I sort of know what I can and can't do now and I've just been obviously with what's going on now without the gyms and that it's been really tough because yeah. I haven't been able to test myself as much as I've been keeping going as much as I can but yeah the knee, the knee feels great now I, I, I'm hoping that pre-season will still be scheduled somewhere I don't know where yet but that's that's what I'm targeting at the minute to maybe do a, a little pre-season maybe with a part-time team local or something just to just to build it up, see how it goes, and then just see where we go from there, really. Because like I say, I just, I just want to play again. I was, it's been so long now. I just, I don't mind what level, who with. Um, I just want to be out there kicking the ball again. So uh, we'll, we'll just see, but hopefully, hopefully, we'll know a bit more. Everybody in general in the next 
few weeks what's going to be happening with this season and and obviously next season. Yeah, yeah, it is probably the complete wrong time. Really, it's all a bit up in the air, isn't it? But um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, you get something sorted next season. You get something sorted next season. And I think you've made it pretty clear that your aim is to get back into it as soon as you can. Um, hopefully, still a few years away yet. But what, what do you reckon after retirement? What do you think you'll be up to then? Um, you know what. I, I do I do like coaching and I, I want to I, I would like to be a coach but I, I don't think I'd want to do I don't think I want to be a first team coach or okay. I think I'd like to do like an academy I think it'd be very rewarding seeing young lads come through and, and progressing and um, I think that'd be really rewarding so I think that's something that I'd like to do I'd have to give Mr Scally a call yeah get down to Jules 100% <laughs> get down 100%. to Jules and get in the academy there or something <laughs> Yeah, because I think that'd be brilliant. Just basically passing on the my knowledge and information that I've gained along my career. Because, um, yeah, I think it can help help some people along the way. Yeah, I'd love that because I know, like, obviously you've got likes of Steve Lovell, um, AD Penn, Andy Hesentai that used to play for the club. But um, yeah. I'm I'm 21, and my first game was in 07 when when I was eight, and no one really had come back to the club that used to play for us during my time. And then Simon Royce, right, yeah. Simon Royce was goalkeeping coach this season. I was like, oh, this is sick. So like seeing you come yeah. back, that'd be brilliant. And the last question that I do ask everyone, or we ask everyone that comes on, I think you've sort of answered it there, but um, maybe a bit tongue in cheek, but could we ever see you back at Gillingham in any form? My dad, my dad still wants you there as a player, but maybe in any other form. <laughs> well, I did see Mr. Scully at an Ebsfleet game not long ago. And I sort of half hinted, I said, look, Mr. Scally, I'll be available next season. He he laughed it off, so I don't think that'll be happening. Uh, uh. <laughs> but no, yeah, uh, um, you never know. I mean, I, I'd love to come back and do some sort of coaching uh, in some sort of capacity at the club, but uh, we we'll just have to wait and see, see where, where life takes us. But yeah, it'd be great. Um, I will come and watch games when I'm not playing myself or coaching or whatever so yeah. hopefully I will get to see some of the fans and the people around the club that I didn't get to say uh, buy to properly yeah yeah no, it's, not, it's not too late as a player surely I reckon you could you could do it 100% we'll see <laughs> as long as the knees are right as long as the knees are right because it's been hard because I haven't been able to test it out properly I got to a stage in my rehab where I was running just got just getting up to sprinting but I was just doing that change of direction so I'm doing stuff like that myself now but yeah to actually get back into the physical side of it I don't know how that's going to stand me instead at the minute so that's something that I'm going to have to just obviously like we say the timing of everything that's going on in the world has not been great for me personally but there's a lot more important things in life than, than football sometimes <laughs> yeah 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 that's fair enough that's fair enough but um, yeah no that's that's absolutely brilliant I wish, I wish you all the best of it I really do and hopefully from next season at least we'll see, we'll see you back involved and um yeah, top man. We'll, see we'll see your name pop up a few more times. Yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. Take Brilliant. Care. Thanks, mate. So that is that for this episode of JFG Meets. I'd like to give another huge thank you to Cody for taking the time out of his day's chat to me. Please do like the video if you enjoyed, and feel free to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel as well. Please check out all of our other platforms, which could be found in the description, and do let us know anyone else related to the club that you think we should get on the show in the future. We do have a few episodes lined up already, so keep an eye out for those, and please check out all of our previous episodes as well if you fancy it. See you soon.